you've got you know probably not very much and you're living in this noisy place and you're locked up but you you learn to cook and you feed yourself nutritious food like cooking in a kettle and um one of the things that I loved 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 working there was because I kept seeing that how creative human beings are and how amazingly resilient like if they can't have something or do something they'll find ways of making that happen um and you know I can't imagine what it must be like to live in a, a prison cell uh and I I don't I don't, I'm not a brilliant cook so you know to for people to be able to go right yeah I'll learn to cook and I'll cook in my kettle and I've, I've even heard that people have made cake but I, I just don't know how that would work <laughs> But they certainly make hooch uh, at, at Christmas as well. So <laughs> perhaps we won't go into that. <laughs> um, and how has Beyond Recovery done through the COVID period as well? And do you know how it's affected the prisoners? Yeah, so COVID's been very difficult for prison residents. Um, they are, or they were during COVID, like, like <laughs> hooch is like a dog. <laughs> Um, they were locked up for um, 23 hours a day. <laughs> it's not just for Christmas, Pooch. <laughs> Very good, Derek. <laughs> um, yeah, they were locked up for 23 hours a day, and uh, which is not funny. And um, and just to put that in context. That's 23 hours a day for the for the entire time that we were in and out of lockdown. People were st stuck in their cells. So um, they didn't get access to mental health uh, providers, to education, to the library, to faith, to visitors. All of that was taken away from them. And somebody having their liberty taken away is the punishment. You know that it, 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 whether or not you agree with that is is another subject. But the the law is that if you break the law, there's there's you know a sentence that a judge can give you, and that is to take your liberty away. It's not to take your human rights away, and um, I think that's forgotten sometimes. Uh, so I think it's affected uh, the whole system really badly. It was closed down. We couldn't go in anymore. So Beyond Recovery's business has completely changed. And um, I am very concerned about the impact of all of those people coming out back into society with, with no support and no help and no rehabilitation. Um, and I believe that they're still locked up for, for long periods of time, uh, even though there is some, there's some let up in some prisons. So it, it's opening up a little bit now, but it's very, very slow. And the other problem that you have in prison is that the technology is non-existent. So you can't Zoom, um, you can't send in iPads, even secure iPads is really difficult to get in. Um, there was somebody with severe um, severe anxiety problems that who, who was had a lot of suicidal ideation. I was going to see him every day for a period of time until I got stopped, and and I couldn't even get access to call him on a daily basis. So, you know, the sort of services are limited, and uh, so I think it's had a, a massive effect on the on the whole system on beyond recoveries and we got we, we we just got very creative and um and you were involved in this Anne Marie and creating activity books for people and that turned into a distance learning program and CDs and for those that can have them and uh various things prison radio shows and uh, and so on so we we pivoted so that we could provide something and that's been reasonably successful this is a good segue you're good at this um reasonably successful we had a 19 percent 
um, completion rate for that, which doesn't sound big, but in the system that we're in w- was good. Um, and we've learned from that. So there's, you know, we need to make our packs more accessible to people with learning differences, for instance, and to younger people. And um, we want to do more radio shows so that we can be impacting people, um, even though we're not in there. And, you know, I'd like to to read the uh, missing link, for instance, and have a missing link show on there and uh, things like that. So there are things that we could do. There's another stage where we want to try and develop some technology, but that's that's further down the line. Um, but we didn't change in terms of what we what who we want to serve. We just changed in the way that we we tried to serve them. Um, so I guess that's the segue into the crowdfunder, and um, and that's why we're running a crowdfunder at the moment because we've realised that if we could put out more shows and have you know families working with the residents at the same time um, we can have a bigger impact so even though they've got less access to other things there is something that is you know supporting them Um, and it's interesting because you think that the work is done when someone comes out and they're rehabilitated but the problem is that they often go back to the same community and same friends And the families, if you think about the families, they've lived in um, they've lived in a life where they've had this roller coaster. Oh, he's out. Oh, he's back. Now he's going back again. Oh, he says he's changed. No, he hasn't changed. Um, And they've lived in that roller coaster. So we want to provide mental health services for them as well. And then that way, when the resident comes out, they're with the family who's also had a shift in understanding and then that, that could be a, a tighter bond um, and, and be more fruitful. It's coming up to the top of the hour now, so I thought I might open it up, see if other people have any comments or questions they'd like to raise with Jacqueline. Please. I've got a question. Uh, First of all, can you can you hear me? Yes. Yes, of course. Uh, First of all, I admire what you do. Uh, I'm uh, jealous that you had the opportunity to meet up with Jack Bransky. I know all his books and uh, as well as uh, books written by uh, Banks, uh, and so and, and many other people on on this subject. Um, anyway, um, I got interested uh, some years ago in this, and certainly um, it transformed my life um, when I retired and found myself in a quite deep depression. Actually, I got out uh, of it only thanks to the three principles. So that's just a comment. Um, as I said, I use uh, three principles now in my work as a coach, um, and it makes a difference. To be able to understand, um, it's, it's quite easy to understand. It's more difficult to, to live life according to the three principles. Um, and that's really all I, I, as I said to you, it's um, uh, for those who don't know much about the three principles, it's a time to find out. That's easy. Thank you, Tom. Okay. That's beautiful. Thank you. I only wanted to say thank you, Jacqueline, also for all you do within the prisons, outside the prisons and the change you make. I know you get a lot from it yourself from giving you receive don't you uh my curiosity was sparked at one of the free p conferences listening to you and the boys and uh and you've made a, a big difference to me so thank you and, and thank you boys uh, to derek and omer uh, thank, you, thank you god bless you blessed to have you in our lives i realize that some people um 
coped with the bereavement in a very different way and, and didn't process it. And I've come across since, since I've been looking at this, lots of people who've not processed a loss. And it occurred to me that I, it, it was quite different for me. Um, and I remembered something that happened when, when Steve, my husband was ill for, um, well, he, he was ill for quite a while, but he was only diagnosed about three months before he died. Um, and my brother-in-law and his family and lot, lots of my friends and other family were amazing. Um, but my brother-in-law basically uh, and, and his family put their lives on hold to come and help me look after Steve. And um, he was, um, he'd taken a couple of weeks off work and he, he was down here and we got to the point where um, he had, you know, he had to go back and he was sitting down with me. I couldn't by this stage look after Steve on my own because I couldn't lift him and, it, you know, I, um, Brian helped me with that. And so we were sitting having a conversation and he sort of said, look, I've got to go back to my, my life now and, you know, we need to think about whether you're going to hospice care and what, how you're going to cope and where, you, you know, where you're going to get help from. And I think I said it to him, which is a bit of a shame really, but I said, said well, I've got no other life to go back to. This is my life. You know, I, I, I haven't got another one. And it, it dawned on me that quite often when people are bereaved, they do have another life to go back to. You know, if it's a parent that's died or, you know, friends or whatever, there's, there is a, a life that you can get immersed in and, and, um, and not, you know, manage not to process the loss. But I didn't really have that choice. Um, Steve and I were both um, not really working. So we were in, you know, we were together in the house. We just bought a new house about six months before he died. Um, and so I had to really um, process the loss. I had, I had no choice. <laughs> um, and what I found as I, I was going through this was that I, I realized that if I went with the grief um, and I spent quite a lot of time on my own. I mixed up, mixed it up sometime on my own, sometime with other people, but I needed the time on my own so that I could grieve. And so I could really cry if I needed to, or, you know, let it all out. Um, and that I found, and, that, and this is, I think where the three principles comes in. I found that when I did that, when I wasn't frightened of my experience of feeling the loss, that it moved through much quicker. And I, I was able to, you know, to sort of, carry on and I also realized that it depended where I was at in my thinking how it affected me so if I was having thoughts like we just moved into this house you know Steve had spent a year doing it up and you know he shouldn't have gone he should still be here with me or you know this he was, too, he was only 57, you know, it's too young to die. I had all of these things and, and all the guilt as well of could I have spotted it sooner, could, you know, all of those things. So if I was thinking those, I would go down pretty quickly. <laughs> Whereas if I was thinking I had an amazing experience with this man, we lived, you know, I, I loved him and we, we were really great friends and it was a gift, you know, to, to have had him in my life. Um, and I'd had in mind that even though we hadn't been married for, you know, we'd only been married about 17, 18 years, but we'd been together since we were both 18. So, we, you know, not together. We'd known each other since we were 18 and we've been friends since then. And so when I started to look at the gifts of the situation, everything changed. Um, really, it, it helped. And it, it came quite quickly for me that the, the, the gift side of it. And one thing that I... I realized, I think, well, I think because there were a lot of people around when he was ill and there was just such a beautiful feeling amongst us all in the house because there's no pretense when someone's dying. It's, you know, you're, you're, you're there, you're present, you have to be, it's, you know, there's, there's that. Um, and so I, I, I realized quite early on that there was a gift in this situation um, and that, the gift was um, that Steve had given us a wake-up call. 
Um, we spend our lives thinking we're going to be here forever. You know, this is it. And we have that whole, you know, well, I'll do it when I'll, you know, I'll put it off and then I'll do whatever I'm going to do. And, and suddenly, you know, this group of people all about the same age are going, oh, you know, this is it. This is, we've got to get, if we're going to do something, we've got to get on with it. And I think um, one of the phrases my friend, um, friend who's, who's more like a sister to me, my friend said, if, if we were talking about what we were going to do, we'd be going, if not now, when? <laughs> you know, because it really does sort of focus your mind on the fact that we have, you know, we're, we're here for a, for a short period. Um, and I, yeah, that, that, that wake up call, I think, was there for quite, you know, a lot of people. It wasn't just me. There were a lot of people who, who saw that. Um, and at, um, we had a, um, uh, well, we had a celebration of life service um, at the time. And then about six months later, we, we had a, um, we actually buried Steve's ashes. And I remember at that, I, I didn't actually find what I read at the time, but I remember at that saying about the gift that he had given to us. Um, um, yeah, I think the thing that came to me a lot was, you know, we all die. It's just about the timing. Um, it's just when, when it's going to happen. Um, and I also found lots of um, lots of synchronicities. Um, I spoke, I think, I'm not sure if I've spoken in any of the groups about it, but I've found in my life that it, the picture that came to me of it, it being like two lines. So there's the spiritual line that goes along and it's always there. And then there's my lifeline. And sometimes they're really far apart and sometimes they're close together. Um, and during this time, they were very close together. I, I really was feeling um, synchronicities of things. And I think one of one of the first things, um, I mean, first of all, when after he died, I had a really strong feeling that that wasn't it between us. You know, that he was still going to be around in some in some way. Um, and I was working on what we were going to do for the. For the funeral i didn't really want a traditional funeral steve wasn't religious he wouldn't have wanted a church service and i know when we've been talking about things before not when he was ill because he wasn't really in a state to talk about it then but when we lost our own parents and we were talking about what we'd want in our funerals and things and he said um really that's for you you have a i'm, I'm a quaker you have a quaker meeting if you want because it's not not for me it's for you um, but there weren't enough of my friends who were Quakers. And so I thought that that's not going to quite work. It doesn't work unless, you know, there's enough. And also, um, so I was sort of stuck in, in, in not knowing quite what to do. I wanted it to be a celebration of his life. I wanted it to be something really important. And I remember sort of waking up in the middle of the night and suddenly remembering a book that I think Steve had bought me, actually, called Bound to Slow. Um, by uh, Miranda, she was called Miranda Holden at the time, I think she's changed her name now. Um, but she started up an interfaith ministry. And I suddenly thought, yes, that's what I need is an interfaith minister. I didn't, um, I didn't want someone who's religious, but I wanted someone who was spiritual. And so that was, um, that was it. And, and that was like, you know, that's come from somewhere. That's not just, just me. And when I looked at looked it up I think I probably got my um, phone out in the middle of the night and I was searching for local interfaith ministers um, and there were a couple who were local and there was one who had a, a nice website and so I contacted her the, the next day and, um, and she was able to do it but I then found out that she knew a lot of the, my Quaker friends so there was a real connection with them that had come out of nowhere <laughs> so I didn't you know I hadn't heard of her before so that was um, that was really really interesting um, and there's other times when I felt that um, Steve has been there with me in um, I um, 
we used to we, we met in London and we used to spend a lot of time down there um, and the very first time I went down there after he died it was like a, a new onslaught of grief because there were all the things I remembered you know that I'd forgotten about in our, our London life um, and I remembered something that had um, happened years ago when we were both students and we'd been we'd been out for the the evening in a pub and there was a singer and the singer st started singing um knocking on heaven's door and it was the you know it was really late on and if we'd stayed to to listen to all of it we'd have missed our train and i really wanted to stay and steve being much more sensible than me dragged me out so that we'd catch our last train and if a few days later, um, he turned up with a single of knocking on heaven's door for me, which was really sweet. Um, anyway, I was in London, very close to where that had happened. I mean, the pub's now been knocked down, but it was it was physically very close to that. And I, I was I was feeling quite emotional, and I just thought I'll just go into this bookshop and while I'm you know sort myself out. I don't know why I was going to the bookshop, but as I got there a busker outside started playing, knocking on heaven's door. And I was like, oh, okay, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> you know, you're here somewhere. Such a state of mind of feeling bad about yourself, not feeling enough that you want to, you want to feel better. You want to, and, and you keep insisting and having arguments about what he should be doing and how he should be showing up that, and you're not getting anywhere. So yeah, having a lover kind of did occur to me, but I thought, no, I mean, too complicated. And <laughs> um, so I I looked outside and, and to me that looked like, again, I was looking outside, but elsewhere. It was more to do with the uh, work and how I could train and educate myself in what you know my interest was. And, and how I could feel uh, more fulfilled in the area. So I was doing that. And I did it. I got very busy again, <laughs> but out there. And it was good because obviously I did follow what um, I felt I wanted to do. So it was all about self-development. And then I trained in homeopathy and I had a busy practice for, for, for 15 years. So quite successful I was a cookery teacher for six years before <laughs> becoming a homeopath and it was all good stuff and uh, it gave me some satisfaction and and I felt better about myself uh, but it wasn't enough and I didn't know why and but at least I took some pressure off Michael you know it wasn't just it didn't have to come from him it could come from somewhere else. And I got very busy and, you know, and, and felt better. And I, you know, I had a sense that there was something more to me than just than, than this tension, inner tension. There was something more peaceful about me, more rich, more, but, you know, with more potential for peace of mind but I didn't know what it was and uh, and then uh, again life happened many things happened and again sometimes I would feel absolutely happy but I thought it was random I thought they were just coming or some someone did say say something nice to me or my kids did well at school or and I'll say, oh, I feel great. I'm a good mom. Oh, I feel, you know. And again, didn't, ha didn't make a connection with how I was using my mind. Okay. And I had a sense of a bigger me, a bigger side, deeper side to life. I did. And in my spiritual kind of journey, I came across several things that made me explore that. But there was something missing and I didn't know what it was because it didn't sustain. I remember going to uh, relationship weekends with Michael 
and uh, and like maybe for a week or 10 days we would feel really good and I would come home with the all good intentions of meeting his needs and making him feel valued <laughs> and he making me feel desirable and all that you know but it, bloody yes it was hard work and it didn't feel it felt synthetic I don't know if that this is the right word but it felt it wasn't and it's, of course it didn't sustain and I didn't know why I thought there was something wrong with us with me more than with him what's wrong with me you know this is a good man this is someone is a good dad and uh and then yes and then you know like all of you on this call i think but not all people people who will listen to this something i came across something that ex explained a very simple thing that i overlooked and i didn't appreciate all those years of what at times felt like torture I, I have to really be honest, it was such hard work. And I don't know how I stayed, we stayed together, really looking back. I don't know how that happened, but we did. And I'm glad we did. Um, and so what I came across was just a very simple understanding of how I was, had been using my mind, how we use our mind as human, human beings. And it was an, uh, an explanation that nobody's ever given me. Not so simple and strict. You know, there was always some other extra attached to it that needed to be done in order to feel a certain way. This one didn't have anything on top. But not only that, I had my first realization of how beyond all the stories and the noise and the thinking and the, everything that was going on in my mind, especially during those difficult years, beyond that, there was nothing to fix about me. And I had an infinite, it, it, like a well of potential for peace of mind and connection and a well of potential for potential for deep, true, beautiful connection with my husband, not only with him, but with life, with myself, with life, with my children. Uh, because that's how we are. Beyond all the confusion and the noise and the fears and the and everything that we think we are um, sentenced to live within. There is this other thing going on, <laughs> which I felt sometimes, but of course I never really quite embraced and acknowledged and owned and embodied. I thought it was just, um, random or to do with something outside in the world happening you know around me so I had the first realization and I it's a mystery how we get to realize that sometimes and touch that space and think oh my god it's true for me as well I'm, I'm not an exception <laughs> and it's true for everyone else it's true for Mikey through my kids who are often worried about so much or what is sick about them, is true for them too. So we all have it equally. How beautiful is that to realize that? So I did that. So here's what happened. I, I, I thought that there were, you know, in life, in a relationship, there are all sorts of different boxes with all sorts of different problems. 
and uh, we need to in a good relationship you want to kind of mutually agree to look into each box and kind of look what it's in there and analyze it together and come up with a, a way of dealing with that that problem after you've analyzed it <laughs> usually needs a lot of talking and a lot of listening that he wasn't doing and um and uh, and and the boxes keep keep growing in numbers and there's always another box <laughs> there's another there was another issue that needs to be discussed and another you know problem to, needs to be solved and suddenly all these boxes were not there suddenly there there was just this one thing thank you so that much said, for inviting okay. me. um for those that don't know like I kind of like i've watched Anne marie's journey and she's watched mine for the last few years so it's lovely that we can both connect now after kind of going like this and <laughs> each other's journey um so really like my my story in short is that um it wasn't great actually well to me it wasn't great it was kind of horrific um sort of mental physical abuse growing up being locked in a room homelessness fell into alcohol fell into cocaine and um kind of felt really lost i didn't know which box i fit in um and that's it i just it, it wasn't great for me really and i just got to a point where i just that's it. I'll just keep my head above water. Like nothing seemed to make sense. Everyone else's life was great. And even I'll try and copy their life and it just didn't work for me. Um, but one thing that almost like I can look back now at the time, it didn't seem that way, but growing up for me, a lot of it was about money. Like society told me that if I had money that I'd be okay. Um, and coming from a childhood where, like, my mum was a seamstress, so it was, we didn't have a lot of money there. My dad was a drinker and gambler. So to me, it's like, okay, money's the safety net. So I fell into a career of a state agency, worked hard at it, um, done really well, actually. Um, I was in for a work for a corporate company for 15 years, was in the top 10 branches out of 750 offices, done so well. And in the end, it was a case, well, why am I doing this for a corporate? I'm going to go and set up my own business. So I did set up my own business with another person um, and we flied. We were number one in the area out of 67 estate agents. Um, started earning an incredible amount of money to the point, I mean, like buying, I could luxury holidays, I'd buy an oxygen machine for £700. Christ, anything I wanted, it was there on tap. I didn't have to worry about money. Um, but the crazy part is I was never happy, still wasn't happy, you know, and I think it's an innocent misunderstanding where society says, you know, if you've got money, you'll be okay. You know, but kind of really, no one tells you how much money you need. Um, and it just, it, I'll be honest, like, I just started just behind this mask here. I just, and that's what I loved about a state agency. I could go in there and put this act on, you know, and they say estate agents, isn't it? They kind of have this way about them. And it is, I could go in and I could put my sales face on and that was me. But behind that, I was just sinking further and further, failed relationships. Um, had There was twice I'd wanted to check out. I remember being on the phone tonight, like 999, and I was like, these thoughts are coming in, I'm scared. Um, it, was, it was horrible. I start two failed marriages. Um, like friends just started falling away, not because of an argument or anything, but they just, it became too difficult for them to be around me and see me suffering all the time. And um, then I came across this, uh, an understanding called the three principles. 
and through a friend of mine whose life she completely transformed and I was curious about it because I tried everything CBT hypnotherapy NLP Reiki the gym I mean honestly anything you can think of I tried it right <laughs> I don't think there's I spent thousands and there was this thing called the three principles and I tried to google it she's like you need to do it and she scared me because she changed so much and um I was like nah I said, I'm not, no, not interested. I'd Googled it. I couldn't really find anything about this thing that she'd been on. So I was like, I don't know what you've had, but there's nothing on the internet about it. I'm really not that sure about it. And then there was a one day course and I went on and it wasn't about the three principles, but that was weaved in within it. And, um, there was a Scottish man on a video that I really didn't understand what on earth he was going on about. Um, but what happened, I had a friend of mine called Rob at the time, he gave me this book called The Enlightened Gardener. And I came home and I read this book and I was kind of really calm at the time. And, and you know what? Something in that book shook me it was um I saw something that for the first time was huge for me was that my mum and dad my parents did love me and I saw in real time how much pain that they were in so they could only project out to me. They just didn't have the love to give to me because they were in so much pain. And that was huge for me because up until that time, I thought that I was unworthy, that I was damaged, I was broken, that there wasn't anything about me that could be loved. And I, so really up until that point, there were two really big attachments in my life. One attachment to money and the other attachment was to wanting to be loved, to feel that. And um, so what I saw in this book, it kind of had a little bit of a domino effect. I still didn't really understand it. I couldn't really make sense of it. And, um, but for me, there was something there that, that seemed to resonate, that seemed to be true. It's like I kind of knew, it knew it, it sounded familiar and felt familiar for me. And um, I said, I got curious about this. And at the time I worked with the homelessness demographic as well, because I'd always, obviously having suffered from homelessness, um, working within a state agency, obviously there's those that can't afford a home. And I, it's funny, I had a conversation with someone earlier today and we were just saying, you know, they, there seemed to be a realness about someone on the street. There wasn't, a, there wasn't, the, there wasn't the attachment to money. There wasn't, um, it's just almost like what you saw is what you got, you know, it was so, it felt real. And so at that time, there was a lot of street outreach going on. Um, and I was like, great, they can have this because I'd already by that point started to see that I wasn't broken. Um, they can have this. Anyway, so then I'm going into the estate agents and over time, like myself and my business partner, we just started getting further and further apart. I became less interested in the money. Um, I saw that money wasn't sustainable. It was made up. You know, that someone, that we could take a house on the market. I could make up a figure for this house. Not make up, obviously, but kind of 
tell someone this is what your house is worth, I don't know, say 400,000, you'd have 10 people saying, no, I don't, they didn't even want the house for, for nothing. I just don't even want to make an offer. Then someone will come in and pay 400,000. And I was like, wow, that's incredible. And it is, we just fabricate the value of money almost. Um, and I started to see that more and more, you know, like, Christ, okay, that person, like someone came up and they just spent like 30 grand on a car. I'm like, Jesus Christ, I wouldn't even have that if you gave that to me for free. <laughs> I wouldn't drive that, you know? And um, so the attachment to money or what society had told me, that, that was a belief that I'd grown up with. That started was, to fall away. It was not something that I had aspired to do. Uh, it was actually something that happened um, in my mid twenties, which is usually quite late if someone's wanting to embark on that career. But um, I had finished my master's degree in cultural geography and I had realized that I didn't want to continue on to do the PhD as I thought I was going to be doing. And so I was at a point in my life where I realized I wanted to um, find something that was more aligned with what I truly wanted to do in terms of my life purpose, what I felt called to do. And so when I originally went to university, my intention was to become a doctor. I'd wanted to be a doctor my entire life, ever since I can remember. And then when I was in my second year of college, I, I kind of fell apart. I had a uh, really, my, I think probably my first experience with serious depression and um, the coursework that was required for medical school, I just, um, I didn't like any of it and I wasn't good at it. <laughs> and so uh, I went to see uh, a counselor, an academic counselor at that point and, He's, you know, I had done quite well the previous year. And so he seemed to think that I was capable on the academic front of doing it. And that um, I just wasn't interested in the classes. I don't think he understood the level of uh, mental and emotional suffering I was in at the time. And I probably didn't share that much with him. I don't remember. But basically he said, you know, you either have to just buckle down and do the work or you should just do the classes that you enjoy. <laughs> I thought. I didn't think it was a choice to buckle down and do the work. I didn't have the bandwidth within me. Um, and I didn't think about getting support around how to help me with organic chemistry and calculus and all of these things. And so I just took the courses that I really enjoyed and what I was um, really finding uh, enlivening and educational were the courses I was taking in uh, geography, cultural geography, human geography. Hi. And so I went on to do my master's. I uh, studied in Latin America, uh, did some research there and wrote my master's th thesis and then realized that I don't have the juice for this <laughs> anymore. And I really, at that point in time when I was studying in Latin America, I got very sick with parasites and I went to the Western medical doctors and they were telling me there was nothing wrong with me. And I knew that I was not myself and they couldn't figure it out. And so I started a path. That's really where I got into yoga, meditation, uh, natural health, naturopathy. And so it opened up a whole world that I'd never experienced before. And I really fell in love with it. And so as part of that journey and part of what was to do with my falling apart in the second year of um, college, I think that part of it was that I had just always learned to kind of not be with my feelings by working hard and looking for external success. And there was a, a bad car accident that I was in and I wasn't badly injured. I just had some minor whiplash, but it was one of those moments where I was like, am I gonna die? Like I really thought I was going to die in this car accident. And rather than having sort of this incredible gratitude for life afterwards, I just went on this tailspin and um, it just, it really, 
it was it was a waking up but through a dark night of the soul or a dark night of the ego as they say so um as part of that the realization that um you know based on childhood experiences based on um you know uh, the way things played out with my mother and my father, I hadn't had contact with my dad um, since I was very young and he, he left and, uh, you know, I don't know all the ins and outs of it. And there's always two sides or more in a sense to a story, but uh, he, I, I know he wasn't in my life. And I started to look in the direction of the, the pain and the suffering that I experienced as a result of that. And I think that was part of what I was, coming to terms with in a way that I hadn't acknowledged that uh, during that time. And so as part of that journey, there was a point here, I had decided that I was going to find him. And he was living in, I knew he was living in England at the time. And so I was living in Canada. And so I decided um, when I was doing my research in Guatemala, I got a job at a, a Guatemalan textile museum in London. And so I had everything set up to move to England after I finished my master's thesis to try and find my dad. And um, a few months before, in the spring before I was supposed to leave, Angus and I met. So I wasn't a professional model at the time. Um, I was getting my hair cut for free at Vidal Sassoon uh, in exchange for doing, you know, occasional modeling things for them. And so I'm in the middle of my thesis. My hairdresser says, can you come in? We're doing, a, we're doing a, a shoot and I'd really like you to be part of it. If you, know, if you get chosen, cause you have to get picked. I'm like, no, I can't do it. I'm sorry, I'm too busy. I've got this thesis. It was getting down to the wire. I think it was February and uh, I needed it done by May and I had a lot to do. And so I'm like, no, I can't do it. And he said, well, we have this really, lovely photographer coming photographer coming from England I really think you should meet him and there was something inside of me that's just like okay I'll come <laughs> forget about the thesis and so I went and it was one of those moments where uh they he this is funny he told me because I was a student, I didn't really, you know, couldn't afford nice clothes in a sense, wasn't really caring that much about how I looked. He said, he said, come in the back door. <laughs> You're going to come in the back entrance and I've got some clothes for you and we're going to do your hair and makeup. And then you'll, um, you know, go in front of whoever the people were that were choosing to see if you can be chosen for this. And so I'm going in the back entrance, I'm walking up the back stairs and who's coming down the back stairs, but Angus. So in the pre you know, adorned form we meet and there was just a really beautiful connection that we both noticed it. There was just a spark that was there. And, um, and so that's how Angus and I met. And so I moved to England and the, the textile museum that I was working at it wasn't working out uh, on a couple of levels. One, there were a lot of preservatives used in the materials to keep them, you know, bright and and to, so they don't degrade. And I was allergic to that. I'd get these really bad headaches. And it, the setup was that I would have free rent uh, as part of my work. That was part of how I was being compensated. And I wasn't really happy with where I was living. And so I said to Angus, I said, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know what to do. What am I going to do? <laughs> and he says, well, you know, why don't you just try some modeling and I can see if I can get, you know, help get you into an agency. Maybe that will help you out um, since you don't know what to do. And so that was kind of how I fell into it. And um, it was one of those things where he introduced me to an agency. They accepted me. And then um, very shortly after that, I was um, flown to Milan and Angus thought he would never see me again because it was like things just kind of took off in a way that nobody was really expecting. So it was by happenstance. Uh, it was it was something that really uh, helped me to uh, have something to do to earn an income uh, while figuring out what I wanted to do when I grew up. And I'm obviously still figuring that out. But through that was how I eventually 
uh, we came to the US through um, both of us working here in that field. And then I went and did a master's in spiritual psychology. And that sort of was the beginning of me getting licensed as a therapist and starting on this uh, next Thank iteration. You. Thank you for that introduction. Um, yeah, Relationship Ready um, is, is, is a course that um, is Leela Turner's sort of um, baby. And um, I, I facilitate on it because I, yeah, I'm just really, really interested to share what I saw about relationship because I can't quite believe it for myself because it was re it was really difficult for me and for many, many years. And then um, I started to see something else and it became really easy. And, I, you know, like, you know, any of us have come across these, this, this understanding, we're used to kind of seeing big shifts but I couldn't quite believe how um, how how literally relationship went from really hard to really easy. So, um, hello, Donna. Welcome. She's a friend of mine. Um, so, um, yes. Yeah, so before pre the principles, which was for me around two thousand and thirteen. So I was I was aged. Um, how old was I? Um, I was in my late 40s, I guess, when I came across the principles. And um, I'd been married, I'd had a marriage that had ended about 18 years before I came across the principles. Um, and I'd had lots of different dating experiences that um, with, with various guys, but from a place of kind of very low self-esteem. And um, I, I was, very much kind of looking for the relationship to kind of fit, make fit me feel better or to fix me. Um, so, you know, when I was thinking about this, this tonight in terms of remapping your life, I was thinking about how, how um, I kind of very much felt like I didn't have the map. I didn't know how to do it. And it's, you know, I'd had quite a lot of relationships. So it's not like I hadn't had them and I was fumbling my way through, but, I really wanted to sort of be handed some sort of map that you open and it says, you know, you start here and then you, then you go to here and then, then maybe if there's this issue, then you take this road. And if there's that issue, you know, I wanted something to show me how to do it because I kept trying to do my absolute best, but it was really, really hard. So, um, yeah, so, um, so I felt like I, I really didn't have the map and, um, and I, 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 was, I was kind of, you know, I was thinking about it in terms of I really felt like I was kind of lost at sea all the time. And I, I felt like I was, you know, I, could, I, could, I can, kind of can go quite far with that, that metaphor because I really felt like I was treading water to try and keep going or keep surviving or keep trying to work out. How to do how to do this relationship better, and I kept getting hurt, um, and I kept feeling like I needed to protect myself and be um, kind of work out how to keep myself safe, but not so safe that I wouldn't dare put myself out there. It was kind of a bit of a balance of like you you know in a way you've got to dive in, right? But at the same time, you don't want, you want, you want to dive in with kind of, as long as I don't get too hurt or, you know, with these kind of um, um, provisos. And um, so, um, yeah, so, so basically the map I kind of made up for myself was that, you know, if I, if I just met the right person, then um, I would feel better about myself. I would feel loved. You know, the things I really wanted to feel were, um, I just, I wanted to, I wanted somebody who'd understand me, who'd get me, who I could feel comfortable with. Um, and, but really what I was doing was, like I said, I was kind of treading water and pedaling really hard to try and get those things. And, really showing up as anything but myself so um 
for me, I thought that I needed to um, to kind of um, pretend to be more together than I felt or pretend to be less bothered by things than I really felt or um, pretend not to show that I was constantly in my head trying to work everything out about what was going on in the relationship or what would happen in the future, but kind of while trying to look quite cool. Um, so yeah, it was really, really hard. And um, so, and, and you know, the other thing that I didn't have the kind of map for was that, you know, if anything was going wrong in the relationship, according to the, 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 the wrong map that I had, the wrong, the wrong map, um, my, my wrong map said that I needed to um, talk to them about it. So it would send me off to that direction. So my map would say, if there's a problem, go talk to them, um, go engage with them about this problem. And I, it never panned out for me, but I couldn't think of anything else to do. What else could you do, right? It's like, if there's a problem, you've got to talk about it. That's what I thought. That was according to the map that I was working from. You had to talk about it. So, um, so yeah, so kind of everything about relationship and everything about the map that I was using was about things being outside in, that this relationship was going to, any relationship was going to make me feel better, that, um, you know, don't show them who you really are. <laughs> Keep that hidden. Um, if there's any kind of problem, go talk to them about it. Um, and in order to keep yourself kind of safe and so you don't get hurt, think about everything a lot so that um, you protect yourself. Um, I, I used to say, oh, I don't trust people in relationship. I didn't trust guys with me. I felt like... Um, I was too sensitive or vulnerable or whatever it was. And I didn't trust them. But really what I was saying is I didn't trust me, but I didn't know because I didn't have the right map that trusting me was the important thing, trusting me to know how to do this or what to do. So I was really all out at sea. And, you know, I, when, I, when I drew it today as a little diagram, I kind of have this treasure island treasure island right where all the good things are and I was all out at sea you know looking on the I was you know I was hitting up against rocks I was trying you know my sea was not like a beautiful turquoise Caribbean sea it was like it looked like the bloody English channel it was dark and cold and not very enticing in that sea um, so that was very much how it kind of looked for me before 